Waves are going to be a big part of our curriculum as we go throughout the year. We'll have to understand them in terms of frequency, in terms of wavelength, and we'll apply waves for the majority of the time in terms of light. So let's take a look at the basics of a wave once again. If we have a wave, we can identify different parts of a wave. These are quantitative things we can measure about a wave. So as we look at this wave as an example, we can identify the crest, which is the top portion of the wave. We can identify the trough as well, which is this bottom portion of the wave. If we measure from one point on a wave to the next successive point on the wave, we'll call that the wavelength. It doesn't have to be from this midpoint to the next midpoint. We could look at it in terms of this point on a wave, and if I go all the way down and back up to this point on the wave, that too is one wavelength. If I measure from the midpoint of a wave to the top, the crest, or I can measure from the midpoint to the trough, that is known as the amplitude. But once again, simply put, a wave is simply a to and fro motion. If I move away and then come back to my original point, that is one complete wave. Here is another example of a wave. Once again, the crest, the trough, and moving from this point away and back again, that's one complete cycle. And mood measuring from this distance to this point is one complete wave, one wavelength. As I look at this wave and I compare it to the wave down below, so here's another wave. What I notice is different about these two waves is something we call frequency. So I see a lot more wave crests per unit time than I do up here. So the bottom wave has a higher frequency than the top wave. Notice that they both have the same amplitude. So if I take a measurement from the midpoint to the bottom of the wave, the trough, this measurement will be the same for both these waves, the midpoint to the bottom. So while they have the same amplitude, they have a different frequency. If I look now at a third wave, this wave has a different amplitude. So if I take this amplitude here, try to measure it up with that, definitely not the same amplitude as the middle wave. The amplitude here looks more like this distance, a much smaller amplitude. The other aspect of a wave I want to point out that we're going to look at in great detail for our lab is something known as the period. So if I time how long it takes to go from this point all the way away and back again to that same point, that's known as the period. The time it takes to go through one complete cycle is the period of a wave. So if we're measuring things then once again, here is frequency, the number of to and fro vibrations in a given time, and the unit for frequency is often given in Hertz. So one vibration per second equals one Hertz. If I look at the period, the period defined as the time it takes for one complete vibration or one complete cycle, and the unit here is any unit of time, or often it is the second. Notice that if the frequency goes up, the time it takes for one cycle goes down. So these are known as inverse or indirectly related. As one goes up, the other goes down. So here is our pendulum apparatus. We have a mass hanging from the end of the string. As we look at a pendulum then, we can see that it's going to vibrate. That we can turn into a wave. We can look at the amplitude of this pendulum by how far we displace it. In terms of a way, we might call this the trough, crest, trough, crest, trough, crest. Now we're looking at frequency. In addition, we can measure the time it takes to go through one cycle. That's the period. We'll look at just three factors that may affect the period of a pendulum. The first is mass. We can change or vary the pendulum bob. We can vary the length of the pendulum. And we can also change the displacement, how far back we pull the pendulum bob. This would be the amplitude. Your materials for this lab consist of this pendulum clamp. 
We can use this pendulum clamp to adjust the length of your pendulum. We simply need to turn this knob and then pull the string up or down depending on the length you want. Don't forget to tighten the knob when you're done. The second piece of equipment we'll use is a meter stick. I will assume you know how to use the meter stick to find length. Another piece is our triple beam balance, which we will use to find the mass of the pendulum bobs. Make sure that your triple beam balance is zeroed in. It should look like this. If it looks like this and it's not zeroed, those lines don't match up, make sure you turn the knob on the left hand side under the pan. Never place anything directly on the pan. Always use what's called a weighing boat. We'll use a protractor to find the displacement or amplitude. We'll have to turn it upside down, so see if you can figure out how to use this. And lastly, a stopwatch. When measuring amplitude, don't displace your pendulum bob more than 20 degrees away from the midpoint. If you move past that, we'll get a double pendulum effect and ruin our lab. Be sure to measure length from the pivot point to the bottom of the bob. To measure the period, take the total time for five complete cycles and then divide by five. For your first lab of the year, it's going to be complicated. Make sure that you're organized and you are ready to go before the lab day starts. In your spiral, have things spelled out. Here's an example. You should have pendulum lab, the problem stated clearly in the spiral, and then below that, we're going to investigate three separate independent variables. So you'll need to make a hypothesis for each one and test each one separately. It takes a lot of organization for this lab. Here's an example. We have one factor we've identified as length that may be affecting the period of a pendulum. Hypothesis. I'll do this as an example and you can do the other two on your own. So for example, your hypothesis may state the period of a pendulum is affected by length. That is a testable statement. How we test that statement? Well, we can write an if-then statement to show how we're going to test it. For example, if we increase the length of the pendulum then the period will increase as well. This may not be what you think. Make sure you write down what you think will happen, but this is just an example. Be sure to create a hypothesis for mass and also one for amplitude before you come to class on lab day. We've already mentioned all the materials you're going to use and how you're going to use them. Make sure you have a list of those materials in your spiral. Don't forget, you need to identify the constants. Make sure you understand what you're going to hold constant for each one of your experiments. In physics experiments, a comparison is really each test group against the other test group. They will serve as the control. So we don't need a separate control for these physics experiments. Here's an example of a data table you'll need for one of your experiments. You'll need three of them, obviously, because you're running three different experiments. I've just written over here IV in the left-hand column, which stands for independent variable, and you're going to want to set up three different experimental groups. Make sure you and your teammates decide how far apart each group will be. On the top, then, we have DV, which stands for dependent variable. We want to run three different trials and then come up with an average. Given our discussion from the previous day, you should know what your independent variables are and what your dependent variable is going to be. Don't forget a title at the top of your data table and also underneath the data table, identify specifically what you are holding constant. This will help you for your lab write-up when we ask you to do that a week from now.